Praise the Lord this morning. Glad to be in the house of the Lord today and happy Father's Day uh, to those that are with us and welcome if you're tuning in with us online today. We welcome you and hope you're having a safe and wonderful day. Uh, just a real quick announcement. We will not be having any life groups tonight. Uh, so uh, if you here at church or our council life group or any of those, we will not be having those uh, since it's Father's Day. We usually cancel those and uh, just want to make you aware of that. If you got your Bibles with you this morning, want to turn back to the book of Romans. Uh, we're still in chapter 1. We'll be starting in verse uh, 18 uh, today as we're looking at Romans and continuing our study of that. And one of the things that you're going to notice today as we continue in this study is there's a little bit of a shift. As we've been looking at verses 1 through 17, it's been really the focus on the gospel and also the credibility of those that have proclaimed it, the credibility of Christ we've looked at. and so, But it's centrally focused about the good news of the gospel. Now as we come today to verse 18, you're going to see a little transition that takes place here. Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit as he's writing this, turns things a little bit. And so today, we're going to be talking about the wrath of God. And everybody kind of freaks out when you say that. But one of the things we see, and one of the reasons I believe the Holy Spirit, uh, in his perfect timing, gave this to Paul in this fashion, is that in order to understand the good news, we also have to be aware of the bad things, of what we've been delivered from. And the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news because it shows that we are guilty of sin, but there's been a way of payment that has been made through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so as we look at this today, uh, we're going to glean some things. And it's a little bit of a challenging message, but it's a piece of scripture that I've preached on several times. If you've been with us at church much here, you've probably heard some sections of it at times because it, it, it's a consistency. It's kind of the uh, Magna Carta of our faith, of what we are and who we are as Christians. And so today, as we look at that, I hope that God will use it to speak to you, whether you're here and you're a Christian, or maybe you're here, or maybe you're listening today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ. It's important for us to understand about the wrath of God, but also the deliverance of God. So uh, if you're able this morning, would you stand as we read God's Word together? I'll be reading uh, verses 18 uh, down through 34, and then we'll look at that and we'll get started today. God's word, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against un all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile, futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we look to your word today, God, uh, we are thankful today for your deliverance. 
But God, let us also be sensitive to this terrible thing called sin. That, Lord, has invoked wrath to those who don't turn and, uh, Lord, to even nations that don't turn from you. And so I pray today that your word would just be, speak into our spirits and our hearts and that the lost would be saved and the saved be revived today. And we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name and amen. You may be seated. I heard a story this week about uh, Calvin Coolidge. And uh, uh, many of you may know him from your history books, but he and his wife were frequent attenders of church. And one Sunday, she was a little bit under the weather and decided she wasn't going to church that day. And so he decided to go on. And when he came home, in the good nature of every good wife or every good woman, as soon as he walked through the door, she asked him, she said, what did the preacher preach on today? Calvin Coolidge simply said, sin. And being a good wife, she couldn't let it in there. She needed to ask more questions. So she started asking him, well, what do you mean by sin? What, what, what was he saying? What was the point behind it? What was all this? And, of course, Calvin Coolidge being the typical man, he said, we're against it. And that's how he summed it up. And really, if we look today at today's message, that's what God is saying here in his word, that there is sin and he's against it. And sin, no matter what fashion or form it takes in your life, we've got to understand that there is a penalty for that sin. And it's hard for us not to understand the dangers that come with a sinful nature. And, and, and today we've been kind of deemed unnecessary or kind of put into a corner, you might say. Because when we begin to discuss sin today, we're, we're looked at differently. Because in today's time, you might say that a, a man may be sick, but you, you would say he's not sinful. You might say that he's weak, but he's not wicked. You, you might say that he's ill, but he's not evil. There's a justification of things. And, and even if you tell people they're doing wrong, there's always an excuse involved with it. Well, it's their genetics. It's, it, it's the way they were raised. It's a situation from their background so that in that sense, nobody is taking responsibility for the sin that's at work in their life. Well, what's happening here and what the Bible shows us is I am responsible for my sin. You are responsible for your sin, and you need to know that today. No matter what your circumstances, no matter what the world is you live in, no matter what your past, no matter what your genetics is, here's what we have to understand. I am responsible for my sin. It's nobody else's fault. I've got to deal with it. I've got to seek the Lord on that behalf in order to find forgiveness and redemption of it. And so once we accept that and understand that, yes, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God, and sin is my decision and my circumstance that I have to be, deal with, then I believe it helps us to, to gain understanding of where we need to be. Because what we're going to learn today in Romans is this. No matter if you're here today, no matter if you're listening today, you've never heard the gospel, you've never accepted Jesus Christ, no matter, uh, it'll answer the question of those who, who've never heard it, what about them? Well, that's going to be answered today because here's the number one issue is that there is sin involved and we've got to deal with it. And when we don't, then it invokes the wrath of God. And so there's three key things that I want to share with you today from this piece of scripture that I believe can help us to understand not only where we're at today, but also hopefully to teach us where we don't want to go. Because Paul was writing in a time that uh, even though it's a couple thousand years later, you wouldn't know it by what he's writing. You would think it's today. You would think he had got up this morning and watched the news or uh, scrolled through his iPad and read the headlines. You'd, you'd think that had taken place today. Because here's the thing. Sin doesn't change. It's in the world. It's active in the world. And we have this nature that wants to rebel against God. And when we do that, there's consequences to that. And so uh, let's look at the scripture today. And uh, uh, these are natural dissension of things if we don't deal with that sin. First of all, I hope that you'll deal with that today, that you've got a relationship with Christ. If not, you need that. But if we don't deal with it, God shows us what happens here. And so starting in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the tr truth. The first thing I want you to understand is the wrath of God. Because people today don't 
uh, always, and, and it's been that way since the beginning of time, don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear about the wrath of God. And, and people say, hey, how could a loving God send someone to hell? How could a loving God allow the things that are taking place in our world today to be taking place? Well, here's where you've got to come back to. It, 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 it's not God's fault in these situations. And that's where we're so blinded to the things of this world that we get confused about. It's the sin issue that's at work here. You see, why, does, why is the wrath of God important for us? Why do we need to know about that? Why does he allow these things to happen? Well, here's why. Because God is holy and just and righteous. He is a holy God. So as a holy and just and righteous God, what should God do with sin? What should God do with our rebellion if I turn and don't do the things that God wants me to do? Well, I can tell you this. If I were to go into a courthouse and, and a, a good friend of mine had been beaten up and torn into and, and, and really destroyed in his life and the person who did it stood before that judge that day and that judge stood at him and looked and said, Hey, uh, are you guilty or innocent of these things? He said, I'm guilty of these things, but I'm a pretty good person, so let me go. Well, if he let that person go, I don't know about you, but I'd be mad. I'd be angry because that's not just. It's not righteous. It's not the way it should be. And so a loving God, the loving God that we serve, the one true God, is a God of holiness and righteousness. And therefore, because of that, he must inflict wrath on those who rebel against it. But here's the thing. You decide it. God offers a solution. But the wrath of God is inflicted on those who choose to rebel and sin against God, which is what he's going to say here. Because here again, at the end of that verse, who by their righteousness, listen to this, suppress the truth. Suppress the truth. And that's the first thing that I want you to understand this morning. The first point that you've got to understand is that everyone has the ability to accept Jesus Christ. But we will suppress the truth. There are many who suppress it, and there's two ways you do that. There's an internal and an external way that the truth is suppressed. The internal way is that we all have a conscience. From the time you're born, did you know that something inside of you tells you there's a higher power? Whether you've heard the message of Jesus Christ or not, there is a conscience inside of you that, that tells you that there's something more out there, there, there's something greater than you that exists in this world that you need to surrender to. And with that, we see in the scripture there in John 1, 9, uh, first John, John, no, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 9. But we see there in, in John's Gospel, it says that he is the light of, that lights the world. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. So Jesus here gives light to everyone. Meaning that there's a consciousness. So from the time a person is born inside of them, they know that there is something greater than them. Uh, a true story, uh, it was done several years back. There was a man who owned a shipping company. He had all kinds of trucks, and one of the things he decided to do is there were certain things they hauled that had high security clearance, and so he decided to do lie detector tests on all of, of the employees that he brought on, the truck drivers. And so just as a matter of fact, he put a question in. One of the questions that had nothing to do with whether they were hired or not, but he just asked each person, do you believe in God? And would you believe in true statement here that 100% of those people who replied no to do they believe in God were found to be lying? Meaning that even in their subconscious, they may say they don't believe in God, but they know there's something greater than them. And this morning, many of you, maybe where you're here, maybe you're listening, you're in that place that you've said there is no God, there can't be a God, but deep down you know there is something. Because God has revealed to you internally that there is a creator. Now, not only that, but he's revealed to us externally. Look at verse 20. It says, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So externally, what he's saying is not only does he give us a conscience that knows there's a creator, but what he's saying is there is no way anyone can look around this world and think this just happened. It has the marks of a creator. You, you don't look at a, a, a painting and say, hey, it just happened there. You know, 
the example I get with that mentality is if you were to go to one of the mines that was running and, you know, coming off that belt is coal and uh, uh, some, a little bit of rock and debris there, uh, the mindset that says, hey, there's no God is the same mindset that would say, hey, I'm going to take a bunch of that rock, I'm going to throw it in the back of a concrete mixer, and if I wait long enough, there's going to be a man or woman walk out of that thing. Now, that's the mentality. We all know that's foolishness. But when we look at the world that's around us and say there's not a creator, we're saying that, hey, this big bang happened, this rock collapsed with this rock, and all of a sudden, here it goes, there's everybody. I mean, it's really foolishness. There is no way. This morning as uh, we're leaving out of here, Jen Carr had her baby with her, and uh, uh, I saw Chrissy and, and them had their baby with them. And, and, and when I look at that, there is no way I can deny there's a creator. There's no way. Look at that little life there. And, and, and it screams out that there's an amazing creator. And so what it's saying here is those who've never heard the gospel, those who've heard the gospel, here's what you've got to understand. Internally in you, you know there's a God. You know there's a God. And, and so that's why he says there in that last statement, they're without excuse. Because from the time you're born and created, you know there's a creator. But here's the problem. Here's what takes place. Verse 21. It says, for, they, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So first of all, what happens is we suppress the truth. Even though we can't deny there's a God, we find a way to do it. And so what it's saying is, although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God. Although in their convictions, although internally they, they knew there was something missing, although in creation, as they looked around, they knew there's a God, yet they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And so here's what happens. If you don't deal with the revelation of God in your life, here's the downward spiral. Whether you're an individual, whether you're a nation, whether you're a society, or whether you're a family, here's what happens. I hope nobody goes past this point. I hope today that whoever's listening to this will humble themselves, have accepted Christ, or will accept Christ today. But, but here's, the, here's the, the delineation of what's going to happen if, if you don't deal with that. And so it, it goes on here. And it says their hearts were darkened. Their hearts were darkened. So when you acknowledge that there's a God and you know that inside of you that's the truth but yet you refuse it, you reject, you rebel against it, it says that your hearts become darkened. And so what it's saying there is there's a process that God, being a loving God, doesn't force himself on you but reveals himself to you but you've got to make the choice. You've got to make the choice. Nobody can make you, nobody's going to force you but you got to listen to your conscience and you got to look around at creation and you got to say, I need to get things right with this one God, the one true God. And so with that, it goes on to how things begin to delineate. Because if you don't accept Christ, remember, in your consciousness there's a void in your life. In creation there's an unexplainable situation. Here's what's going to happen to you. One, you're going to suppress the truth. Two, you're going to fill the void. You're going to fill the void. If you don't have Christ in your life, there is going to be this absence that you're going to go looking for to fill in some way. And you know what that absence is called that you used to fill in with is idolatry. That's what it is. Because if you don't have that relationship with Christ, you know there's something missing in your life, you're going to go looking for it. You're going to go looking for acceptance. You're going to go looking for meaning of life. Some have looked for acceptance in your relationships. Some have looked for acceptance in groups that uh, uh, tell you what you want to hear or, or even to be acknowledged. And even sometimes that can be a church that you can say, hey, I want to be accepted by the church. But it still doesn't boil down to are you right with Christ. It, it goes on in that. And, and in that uh, uh, idolatry, in that void, it, it goes looking into those uh, not just relationships, but it goes looking into meaning of your life. And so you may uh, put all your life into something. Maybe it's job. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's raising kids. Those things are not necessarily bad in themselves, but it's not God. It doesn't have meaning and it doesn't have the purpose of God's life. And so we're looking for that. And those things become idols in our life. Anything that we put before God is an idol. And so some examples of that. That to get you a train of thought here, because remember, if you don't fill it 
with Christ, your life with Christ, there's, there's going to be this void. Well, here's some things to look back in history and see what has happened. In, in history, there was a temple in uh, Lebanon, and it was called Baalbek. And it was a temple to the god of Bacchus, which was the god of drunkenness. And you want to know how people worshipped Bacchus? They went to the temple, and they got drunk. That's how they worshipped him. There was another temple during that day and time, close to the time that Paul was writing this, and, and the name of that temple uh, was Acorinthus, and it was in Corinth, and there there were prostitutes there that hung out there. And you want to know how you worshipped that at that place? You went and slept with uh, prostitutes. And so the reason I tell you those things is because I want you to get in your mind that's what idolatry does to us. It brings us to a place where it legitimizes our vices or our sins. Because those who were going to the temple of Bacchus, uh, they loved to drink, they loved to swarp, they loved to party. And so what did they do? They justified it, and therefore their vices became a way of worship to them. Well, I'm a, I'm a good person because I'm doing what the God of Bacchus wants me to do. And that's idolatry. And you say, well, I would never be that foolish to get so taken away in those things. But yet we do the same today. There's idols in our lives that we're putting before God. There are things that we're denying God's power in and we're seeking our own will in that are creeping into our life. And that's a part of the process. It started out very simply with us suppressing the truth, but now all of a sudden we're trying to fill this void. And look what happens when we try to fill the void with things other than God. Psalm 106 tells us all about it. Psalm 106, verse 35 says, But they mixed with the nations and learned to do as they did. And what it's saying here is without the direction of God's word, without the direction and the power of God's Holy Spirit, you're just going to follow along with what everybody else is doing. They mixed with the nations and learned to do as they did. Meaning that they suppressed truth, didn't put their focus on the one true God. Their hearts became blackened and now all of a sudden, or darkened, and now all of a sudden, here's what's happening. We're doing as everybody else does. There's not enough separation in the church and the world, and that's where you fall into problems because the church should be different. Us as believers, we should be different. But if not, we just begin to look like everybody else. The other thing, Psalm 106, verse 36, it says, they serve their idols which became a snare to them. And so we looked at that today and, and we understand that these idols that we think are helping us or giving us meaning, giving us purpose, giving us something in, that has uh, uh, meaning to our life, it's actually a snare. It's holding us back. It's keeping us from something. And what's it keeping us from? It's keeping us from our purpose, from our calling of God. And, and that's what idols do. They make us focus on this and think, hey, this is, this is where everything's at. I heard a true story as a guy who's playing quarterback in college. And he, he admitted, he said, football was my idol. He said, that ball that I carried in my arm was my idol. I built my life around it. I did everything around it. He said, I, I let my Christian faith go a little bit because my life was about football. And he said he'd never forget it was a big game. It was a rivalry game and a S, uh, SEC football game. Uh, uh, teams that had come together and he said that there he was uh, going in uh, to, for play, he was a quarterback, he said he got sacked hard, messed his knee up and he said the stadium fell quiet he said they loaded me up on a stretcher, they took me back into the back room and he said they worked on me for a few minutes and decided they needed to send me somewhere and he said here's what I remember when they were taking me outside to load me in the ambulance, he said I heard the crowds clapping and screaming he said, here's what I understood, that my idol had just been shifted to somebody else and that I had made no difference in that situation. That which I'd put my whole life in was gone in a moment and nobody cared and nobody noticed. And so it is with idols. They're a snare to us. They entrap us and they hold us back. And lastly there in uh, 106, 37, 38, they sacrificed their sons and daughters to the demons. Now, what we know is this was during the time of Molech, and what would happen is as babies were born, there was this huge statue that they would light a fire under, and that statue was iron. And people would actually take their babies and lay on that statue and that fire and offer them up as an offering to this false god. It said they poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. 
Now, here's what I want you to understand. I don't think any of you are taking babies and laying them on idols. I think we're, we're past that point in life. I think we understand that's not right. But here's what I do want to challenge you in. Here is my concern. If we are not building a foundation of Christ in our children and our grandchildren, and we are not teaching them the truths of Scripture to look at His uh, to, to seek their conscience and to seek the Creator, then in effect we are offering them up because they don't have the tools they need in order to fight off the enemy. And so in a sense, if we are not teaching our kids about Christ, if we are not praying over them and seeking on them, we're no different. We're no different. And that's how generations slip by our hands because we believe that, hey, I'm doing them good by not encouraging them, by not making them live a different life, by letting them be a part of the world. But really what the Bible's saying here is, is you're, you're just allowing them to go into a deeper place of darkness because you've suppressed the truth and now they're going to fill the void. You want to know why there's hundreds of thousands of uh, a generation, a younger generation today that are upset, that are mad, that are angry, that are writing, that are picketing, that don't know what's going on in their life? I can tell you why. Because there is a sin problem in their life that nobody's ever revealed the truth of the gospel to them. They haven't seen what they need. And so what are they doing? They can't help it. They're looking to fill the void. They're looking to find answers. And those are the answers that the church should have been given to them a long time ago. But I'm being honest with you, we've dropped the ball. I mean, we can blame politics, we can blame our government, we can blame our society, but here's where I boil down to. It's the church. We. We have not done a good job. And therefore, we can not hate ourselves, but what we've got to do is look and acknowledge and say, hey, we've got to change this. We've got to turn from this. Because here, if they fill that void with something other than Christ, here's phase three. First, they suppress the truth. Second, they fill the void. Third, they self-destruct. Look at verses 24 through 32. It says, Therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to the impurity and the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Here's what happens. If God doesn't get involved and they fill that void with idols and things that don't matter, here's what happens. They become hardened. They become hardened, and the Bible says God gives them up to the lust of their hearts. They've rebelled. They haven't acknowledged the one true God. You're going and doing your own thing. You're living for the flesh, the lust of their hearts, and so that impurity dishonoring their bodies among themselves, and look at verse 25, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever and ever. You see a transition that takes place, a dark transition here. Because not only now is the void being filled, but now it's self-destructive. Because the snare is locked in place. The void of God is fullness. And so God at some point, because we know in Revelation 3, Jesus stands at the door and knocks, but he doesn't force his way in. So we know at some point there, God stands at the door and knocks. He reveals himself through our conscience, through creation. But there's a day and time where we have ignored it and rebelled against it, and God says, that's what you choose, that's what you get. I love you, but, but you, you get choice, free choice. So, so you make your bed and you lay in it. And so... When we look at that, it goes on, and here's some of the things that I want you to understand. Because when we begin to self-destruct, it's going to happen in three ways. One of those is sexual perversion. And that's what it's talking about here. Gave them up the lust of their hearts. And what happens then is you see less and less of an emphasis on God's plan for a family. You don't see the husband-wife-child model. You begin to see that alternating in many different ways. You begin to see adultery, or you begin to see uh, fornication, all these different things, pornography. All those things become rampant uh, because you're living for you. You're living for the flesh. There's no guidance of the Holy Spirit, but it's a flesh-filled life. And it's a part of the decline of God's wrath that comes into play. And so you see that, but it doesn't end there. It goes on, and it says this. In verse 26, here's the next step. It says, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves due penalty for their error. So right here is a perfect example. 
Because today there are so many that are fighting. There are so many that are saying, hey, the Bible doesn't say anything about homosexuality. God just wants you to be who you are and how you feel and those things. But that's not at all the truth. God says here that, that, is, a, a, that is actually a, a symbol of the wrath of God that's coming upon a people or a nation. Is what's happening here is Paul was saying even in this time this is what was happening. And what's important to understand is he used women first there. That, that's crucial because it, it was expected that, that these men might falter a little bit to say these women were going and doing the same thing because in all other situations, normally he uses a man as the example, but here he says both parties, that it's gotten to that place that they've turned against their natural order. They've rebelled against what God has created them to be. And so it's a sexual perversion. And not only that, but it, it becomes the norm. It becomes accepted. It becomes in those things. And there again, we're not to run around and hate people and do those things. But what we are to do is to be bold in what the Bible says and say, man, I love you and I care about you, but the lifestyle you're living is not acceptable before God. And because of that, because I care about you and love you, I don't want you to get to the place that you're separated from God. Because it's a snare. It's a bad place to be. And if you want to fill your life with something, man, you need to fill it with Jesus Christ. You need to fill it with the power of God that can bring you the joy, bring you the acceptance, bring you the love that you're looking for in other ways. You need to seek after the one true God and say, God, here I am. I surrender my life to you. Change me. Love me. Uh, bring joy in my life. Bring peace in my life. And that's the answer to these issues. But what's happening here is it gets to the place of self-destruction because we're still rebelling against God. God created me one way, but I'm going to be another. God made me this, but I'm going to be something else. And it is that rebellion against the conscience and the creation that God has shown us and revealed to us. And so it's a very dangerous place to be. Now, not only do we uh, see that, but a, a, an example of that in 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 6, God's Word. Because we see that in the time of, of, of Lot, Abraham's brother. If you look at Sodom. You see the sign of the God's wrath that was coming, that the city had turned to such a place of being away from God that all these things that we're reading about here of, of rebellion, of self-destruction, they were taking place. And 2 Peter 2, 6 says, If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what's going to happen to the ungodly. Now, I want you to understand that. Jesus Christ is love. He is the picture of love and the fact that he laid his, down his life to die for us. But I want to tell you this. God is holy and God is righteous and he has to deal with sin. And what this verse tells us clearly in the New Testament is what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah is an example of what's going to happen to the ungodly. That's the facts of the matter. So, so this sin... That, that we're making excuses for, this sin that we're putting on other people, this sin that the world is doing and we're, we're, we're working in it, here's what i got to tell you. It's still sin. It's still sin. And God's still against it. And we've got to turn from it. We've got to seek after and not accept those things. So, so not only in that term of self-destruction do we have sexual perversion, but the second thing, you see social perversion. Social. Look at verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Here's that level going. Started out with sexual perversion, now it's going social. Because their minds are warped. Now it's just a flesh fest. We're going to do what we want to do. We're going to live for us. And it says he gave them up to a debased mind. Meaning that, hey, you've gone so far out there, you're callous to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's just rampant. And listen, verse 29. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness. Now, now I, I, here's the part I say. This was written a couple thousand years ago, over 2,000 years ago. Now, what I want you to understand is think about today when I read these things off. Think about where we are as a nation. Think about where we are as a people. Are, 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 are we, in this sense, socially perverse? Because listen to what it says. It says they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, even evil, Covetousness, malice, they're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. 
They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. You see, when I read that, I, I fall under great conviction to where we are right now in life. Because it doesn't take me very long at all if I open my eyes up to see those things that work in our world today. Now, I can look at that as a gloom and doom, or I can look at that with conviction, with an understanding that, hey, the power of the gospel has the power to change this. Jesus Christ can turn broken hearts, hurting hearts, into secure and wonderful individuals in life. And that's his desire. But nevertheless, there is a pattern that God says, you need to open your eyes and see what's happening. Because this is a pattern that Paul laid out that has consistently been through series. And if there's one thing we learn about the past, it's that we don't learn from the past. <laughs> we keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result. Well, well here's where I'm fearful we are. Here's where I'm fearful because I see these things. I, I, I see the struggles. I see the slanders and the hate, haters and uh, the boastfulness and the pride and the foolish and the ruthless. I, I see all those things that work around us. And so with that, what we've got to understand is, man, we could be suffering from some of the wrath of God right now. That, that, that's sin's issue because we hadn't dealt with it. Now, the last thing, not only social perversion but final thing and then I'm going to have the invitation verse 32 spiritual perversion sexual it goes social because everybody's doing what they want to do there's no order there's no laws you know everybody makes up their own truth now so so we see that social perversion but what about spiritual perversion listen to this this is where the church gets involved verse 32 though they knew God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. If you go back under the law, those things were dealt with quickly. But it goes on and says, they not only do them, saying there, they're not only just doing them, but they're giving approval to those who practice them. You know, there are churches all over the United States today that I'm just being honest with you, they've caved. They're no longer sticking on the authority of Scripture. They no longer proclaim that the Word of God is all authoritative and is infallible. There's other things that are creeping in throughout life. So not only have they done them, but the church itself has given approval to those who practice them. And what God's Word is saying is that's the final step of it all. You've reached spiritual perversion where you've believed the lie and you believe that you can do what you want to do you don't have to abide by God's word that you make your own rules, your own God you create your own mentality of those things but what we've got to understand is that's against God's word and he's saying that's a sign of the ending of the wrath of God some of the ways today we, we see that and especially I was just thinking about it is even how we entertain ourselves as Christians. And I'm not here to give you a lecture and to point fingers at you, but I'm here at myself, pointing fingers at myself. Because the very things that are against what God's Word said, I mean, they're being put out there on commercials, it's being put out there in movies, it's being put out in our society. And here's the thing we're buying it, we're paying for it paying the cable bill we're paying to go to the theaters we're paying for it and so in a sense when I look at that my conviction was this not only am I am I seeing those things but I'm giving approval to those who practice them by supporting those things and by encouraging those things and, and so there's this great struggle that's taking place there and so this morning as they come and begin to play I want to sum this up because I know it's been kind of a hard message. But, but I, I want to summarize because I don't want us to go down that road. I don't want us to repeat history. I don't want us to suppress the truth and to try to fill the void with things and then self-destruct. But, but here's how you stop it. Here's how we put an end to that thing. 
And, and, and it's very simple. I, I want you to know that I love and I'm broken hearted for our nation right now. But I want you to also know this. I, I, I love and I'm broken hearted for a lot of families right now who are struggling throughout life. But my greatest burden, I can fully tell you today, is that I'm broken hearted for the church. Because when I look around, I don't see a government problem. I don't see those things. Yeah, that might be the surface. But here's the bottom line. As a church, if we've been making converts, true conversions of people who put their faith in Christ, our world would be different. Our world would be different. That's just the truth of it. You know, I, I read this week about an incident that happened in Ireland uh, many years ago. There was a great awakening. There was a revival that took place over there. And a, uh, there was a shipbuilding company that was named uh, Harland and Wolf. And they built ships. And this revival began to sweep through their, their little town there. And men and their families were getting saved. And Jesus was just doing an amazing work there. And what began to happen is those men who had been working for that shipbuilding company started bringing the tools back that they had stolen from the company. So much so that they had an employee meeting because it was beginning to be a problem and just announced, hey, we know you've been changed, but stop bringing stuff back to us. It's causing problems. Now, here's what I want you to understand. The management didn't put situations in place. They didn't go browbeating them to find this out. But these men, once the Spirit and the power of God had come into their life, couldn't help but do the right thing. Couldn't help but understand and heed to the convictions of God and return those tools and live a different life. And so today... I don't believe the world, I don't believe the United States, I don't believe Virginia, I don't believe Buchanan County can be changed unless Christ gets involved. And here's how we do that. For Christ to be involved, we need more Christians. We need the Christians who are already Christians. We need to be these people of boldness. We don't need to, as verse 32 says, to just do what they do and give approval to that. We don't need to be angry. We don't need to be hated because here's the way I look at it. You know, they're, 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 they're darkened. They don't know what they're doing. I mean, Satan's got them blinded. It's, it's kind of like calling a call center and chewing out the person at the call center. They're just doing what they've been told to do. We've got to get to the source of it. That source is sin. And so dealing with that, we need to be bold in, in our commitment to the truth of the gospel. But we need to do it in love. We need to do it in boldness so that we can see that transforming power of Christ at work. So, so that's our challenge. But, but also, for some of you who have never accepted Jesus Christ, today's the day of salvation. If you search your conscience... And you look at creation. Paul says you're without excuse. If you think you just happened on this earth and you think all this just happened around you, you're lying to yourself. There is a God who loves you and loved you so much that when he knew that sin would be a part of your life that he found a way of redemption for you through his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Christ died for the sins of all men, that whosoever should call on his name shall be saved. And this morning, no matter whether you're here, whether you're at home, you can be saved through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, set free of your sin, transformed, changed, spiritually awakened and not perverted, just through surrender. Here I am, God. Save me. Redeem me. And I believe today, many of you, that's what God is dealing with you. He's bringing to your understanding a reminder that you've tried to suppress me. But I'm not letting go of you. For some of us as believers during this invitation, it's our time to gather around the altar because here's my brokenness. Church, we, we, we got we to gotta make more Christians. And God has called us to be his ambassadors. So who is to make more Christians? Christians. I hope you're continually sacrificially praying for your one and I hope if your one's already come to salvation you've got another one but that's our role and that's our responsibility and so today 
I, I blame us as the church for the situation of the state that we haven't made enough Christians that we haven't shared our faith and the good news of the gospel enough that people are transformed and seeking to love your neighbor love others as you love yourself love God that's where the change comes so this morning for us as believers it's a time at the altar that we can just maybe repent and come back to God and say God ignite me ignite me maybe I can't change all the world but if I can change one that's one that's one and I'll start with that one maybe it's a time for your family to come to the altar this morning just to pray together just to say hey I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be bold now in my faith and maybe I've never felt comfortable at this altar before but I'm coming this morning and I'm bringing my family or I'm bringing myself and I'm going to seek God if you want to do that this altar is open if you're here this morning and want to receive Christ I'm going to be standing up front. Just want you to come let me know. Say, hey, today, Brother Shea, I, I just, I surrender. I want Jesus to save me. If you're with us online, we got prayer partners. Let them know your choice today. They'll follow up with you, send you a packet. But I'm going to ask you to stand for a time of invitation. Father in heaven, help us. God, we come before you and we repent. Lord, you've trusted us to be your ambassadors, to share the gospel. And God, as a church as a whole, we need to do better. We need to keep our focus on the message, knowing that that changes all things. And so I pray for that boldness. I pray for forgiveness for that. I pray this morning that the lost would be saved, whether they're watching or whether they're here. God, let your Holy Spirit bring conviction. Reveal, Lord, that conscience. Reveal your creation to them this morning. Father, for us as believers, strengthen us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And amen. If you need to come this morning, altar's open.